So there you are. What do we got to say? So, our save our river. So, uh, so what's this for? This is for the uh, Sage Alliance Flotilla. Here we're here on September 15th, and uh, we're getting our boats, canoes, kayaks, pontoon boats, motor boats ready to go out on the river. And we're going to tell Energy it's time to cool it. This is Tinkerbell, <laughs> representing for the Connecticut River Valley, and we want less of this due to thermal pollution and more of this, because if we stick together, it's possible for a few focused people to defeat a corporation. <laughs> Okay. Was that a little film? Yes. Oh, it's good. I don't have to stop, and I cannot tell you that these growths are going to happen if we don't stop this. What, what's going to happen? Tell me. Well, extra hands, extra feet. You know, we'll turn all dried up because we can't drink the water. Over 96% water, right? How's it going to happen? We can't have the water being contaminated. <laughs> 15 degrees is too hot for a fish, too hot for the trout to live in. You're talking about the water? Yeah, the water in the Connecticut River is 15 degrees hotter than it should be. It's supposed to be cold. That's what fish like. Use your cooling towers, Vermont Yankee. So this one says, Andrew G, our river is not your dump. Who are you? I'm Betsy. And that's Barbara? That is Barbara. Yes. And who's in the front? That's, That's Laura. 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 All right. Great boat. Great sign. Gentlemen. Andy, what's up? What's up? So now it's the time to launch. Everybody get in their boats and let's go.
The father of the Gaia principle is one of these people. George Monbiot, the uh, great environmental writer out of England, is another. But there is a, a number of major problems with that position. One of them being that the science of climate change is such that it's clear we do not have time to build out the atomic power infrastructure that even the pro-nuke greens would uh, like to see. Let's just grant their argument for a second. Let's say, okay, uh, climate change is such that it will become self-fueling and run away if we do not act precipitously and build out lots and lots of atomic plants to replace coal and oil, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if that were to happen, how much money would that take? How long would it take? The fact of the matter is, atomic power plants cost between nine and $19 billion to produce. None of them have ever come in on time or on budget. And the fact of the matter is the federal government is willing to guarantee 80% of the risk for an atomic plant. But even that remaining 20%, Wall Street won't go near them. It's just a, it's not a realistic response to climate change. So if you ever find yourself in an argument with somebody who's making the case for atomic power based on the very real threat of climate change, remind them that the dollars and cents and the timeline just don't add up. Even if there can be platinum, gold-plated, essentially very safe plants, unlike this very old model, the time frame for building them is totally unrealistic, given the fact that climate change is kicking in now and, and accelerating. Now, a word on climate change. I'm sure many of you know this. Climate science out of NASA, and there's an international consensus on this, pretty much that the, the, uh, we now have reached a co atmospheric concentration of CO2 that is 400 parts per million. Most scientists believe that at around 350 parts per million, you cross threshold red lines where the problem can become self-fueling, where the melting of the ice caps has accelerated to the point where there's so much dark open water that the Earth is now absorbing more solar radiation than before, and that accelerates the process of, of warming. Or another example of a, a, a feedback loop kicking in after 350 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere is the melting of the Arctic tundra, beneath which is trapped a lot of methane. And methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. The EPA says it's 20 times more powerful than CO2. So we're approaching those tipping points. Uh, and what that means in many ways is that we, we definitely have to, as fast as possible, get off fossil fuels. The good news is we have the money, we have the technology, and they never told you this during the first two years of the Obama administration, we also already have the legal framework to do that. We never needed comprehensive climate legislation. We have the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act of 1970, Clean Air Act amended 1990, 91. And 
what happened was, after the Kyoto Protocol, Clinton signed the Kyoto Protocol. This is an international agreement to cut greenhouse gases. The Senate refused to ratify this treaty. So at that point, a bunch of states and environmental groups sued the EPA and said, look, you have the obligation to regulate greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act. It took 10 years. That case was finally resolved in 2007. The Supreme Court under George Bush said, yes, the states and the activists are correct. The Environmental Protection Agency has an obligation to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Since 2007, we have been waiting for about 30 different rules to come out of the EPA. If they were to embrace their obligations and issue robust rules, they would essentially impose a de facto carbon tax on dirty forms of fuel, which would then drive all sorts of investment immediately into building out clean forms of energy like wind power, solar power, be it concentrated and on a commercial scale or decentralized and uh, feeding into to the grid from residential areas. We're still waiting for most of those rules because the Obama administration has instructed the EPA to go slow on that for fear of offending the Republicans. So we have so we have the laws, we have the technology. It's not like we haven't invented uh, effective wind power, uh, you know, hydropower, solar power, big hydro is a problem, but you know what I'm saying. We have the technology. Also, is there the money? Yes, there's the money to deal with this without turning to atomic power. The money to help build out a real clean energy infrastructure comes from one, potentially the military budget, which is absolutely distorted. I don't need to tell all of you about that. So that could be cut, redirected. But even, let, let's not even think about the military budget for a second. The federal government is the single largest consumer of power in the U.S. economy. Yeah. The federal government alone has a fleet hey, of 450,000 mostly huge office buildings that all buy electricity. If all of those buildings committed themselves to buying clean power and set up a schedule with utilities to help bring that online, if they were all retrofitted to use less power and possibly even become sources of power generation, that would help jumpstart a general market for clean power. Th this is a point that I think is we need to, to talk about and think about, especially in the face of extreme weather and, and the kind of disasters like Irene that, that climate change is bringing. Government is not the problem. It's not the, 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 the bogeyman that the right points out. So a lot of people on the left don't embrace the potential uses of government. So we don't talk about stuff like the fact that about one third of the US economy is already government activity. If you add together the states and the federal governments, they consume enormous amounts of power. So if states, state governments and federal governments committed themselves to buying electric vehicles, purchasing clean power, shutting down nuke plants, we, are, we would be, you know, halfway there. There's tons, there's also tons and tons of money in the corporate sector that is not being invested. I'm not talking about money paid out as bonuses to CEOs or money paid to shareholders. Money held by firms that they intend to invest but are sitting on is now at about $2 trillion. Corporate America, according to the Federal Reserve, has never held more uninvested money at any time since 1956. So there's money to be invested immediately in the alternatives. In other words, we do not need atomic power. Um, the final thing I would say in terms of climate change and atomic power is this, that these are plants, these rickety old plants are very dangerous in, in terms of how we are to adapt to climate change. If we know that there are going to be more extreme floods, more extreme droughts, we have to build into our society resilience. This plant and plants like it are the weakest links in the chain, and that's a new reason why they must be shut down. And finally, the final thing I'll say is just, you know, just remember, whenever people are talking about the future of atomic power, it's a myth. They're not building these plants. China's building a handful of them, but they're not building these plants. So what, you're, what we're really talking about is whether or not we're going to relicense or close down old existing plants, because there isn't going to be a new fleet. All there is is this old zombie fleet, and anyone who thinks that the issue of atomic power is about the future is missing the point. It's about these relics from the past and how they threaten our ability to build a more resilient society so that we can adapt to climate change. So keep up the good work. You're very inspiring. I'm glad to be part of this Coachella.